really uh, happy to have him on the program because he's also actually an international uh, colleague. Uh, and uh, to, I, I would like to ask you, Tony, to start your lecture. Well, thank you, Leslie, for, for your kind words. Thank you so much for inviting me tonight. Um, can you can you see my screen well, Leslie? No, because I have to give it to you. I mean, the let me see. Uh, okay. Okay. To you, so you can uh, start uh, or just click on that. Okay, now we can see it. If you can put, okay. yeah, very good. All right. Well, th thank you so much, Leslie, again for for inviting me tonight. It's a great honor to be here. So, and I hope to uh, you guys enjoy enjoy the lecture. So. Today I'm going to be I'm going to be talking about hold on let me see I'm going to be talking about um, the role of immunohistochemistry in agnexal neoplasms in 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 45 minutes to 50 minutes is is very difficult to to cover everything but I will try to um, talk about the most common situations that you might encounter in your practice so so with that said. I'm going to start talking about one of the most common problems in, in dramatic pathology, which is the distinction between uh, basal cell carcinoma and trichoepithelioma. So, so as you know, this is quite uh, a problem. Uh, it's very frequently encountered in dramatic pathology. Uh, we see this on a daily basis, right? We get these biopsies, and we don't know whether this is a basal cell carcinoma or, or a trichoepithelioma. So if you read the literature, there have been many uh, papers, uh, many studies, and uh, to try to separate these two neoplasms, uh, and that have, you know, have found uh, that none of these markers are magic bullets uh, in trying to separate these two tumors. And the reason uh, of this is because, uh, as you may know, basal cell carcinomas not only can uh, arise from epidermis, but they can also arise from the hair follicle, right? So trichoepitheliomas are hair follicle neoplasms. Therefore, they're going to have overlapping IHC features. Um, as you know, this distinction is quite important because basal cell carcinomas are malignant and trichoepithelioma are benign neoplasms. So here we have a classic example of a trichoepithelioma. If you have a biopsy like this, it would be uh, very easy to make a clear-cut diagnosis. However, we don't always get this type of biopsies and we get this. So when you see this, what do you do, right? Whether is a basal or, or a trichoep is kind of difficult to to uh, to give a unequivocal diagnosis. So if you read literature, um, there are many papers delineating the histologic features mm -hmm. of these two neoplasms. Um, if you see ulceration on its on a small shape, if you, if you see the retraction artifact, if you see mucin or myxoestroma, that would all favor basal cell carcinoma, as opposed to if you see um, uh, benign uh, cells that have this front formation, they have papillary mesenchymal body differentiation that will favor clear, clearly a trichoepithelioma. Um, not always you will see these in a small shape, so that's very challenging. Um, and there have been papers and try to evaluate these. So some of these papers have said that if you see apoptotic bodies, mitosis, and melanin pigment, that it strongly will favor a basal cell carcinoma. And I would agree with that. However, now we know that uh, trichoaps can also show mitosis in apoptotic cells as well. Uh, in, my, in my experience, if you see in a shape biopsy a basal tumor with a lot of pigment in the tumor, that is strongly, is strongly suggestive of a basal cell carcinoma. Uh, trichoaps, uh, you know, rarely show pigment. So if you see this pigment, that should strongly um, uh, favor the diagnosis of a basal cell carcinoma. Uh, in my opinion, immunohistochemistry plays a very minor role. It's, it's, not, it's not so so easy to interpret these stains. And the reason why is what I said before, is because basal cell carcinomas can also arise from the hair follicle. If you read the literature, they have been hundreds of different markers to try to uh, separate these two tumors. Um, in, this, in this slide, you can see the most common markers they have been used to use uh, have been used uh, for this separation. So P53 and K67, if you see that expressed in a tumor that favors the basal cell carcinoma, if you see a strong expression of BCL2 and androgen receptors that will favor a basal cell carcinoma, if you see a tumor that has preserved CK20 positive cells that favor a trichoepithelioma, also the stroma is important to evaluate, 
right? If you see a strongly expression of CD34, that is strongly favor a trichoepithelioma. Um, there's a new stain that is called PHLDA1, which is a um, follicular, follicular stem cell germ cell marker. Um, a, st a recent study found that all trichoaps were positive for this marker, and uh, this marker was negative in all basal cell carcinomas. But my question to this author is, um, what about those basals that have follicular differentiation? Were they uh, included in the study? And I believe they were not, because otherwise they would have been positive as well. Here we have an example of a trichopithelioma with preservation of CK20 positive cells. Um, however, I've encountered many trichoaps that are negative for Merkel cells in the tumor. So that alone should not make a diagnosis of trichoap or basal cell carcinoma. As uh, I said before, trichoaps tend to have uh, C34 expression in the stroma. However, I also have encountered many trichoaps that are negative for C34 in the stroma. If you see BCL2, BCL2 is a strongly favor, if it's strong, I'm sorry, it's strongly expressed in, in basal cell carcinomas. Uh, but they can be lost as well. So it's not a very sensitive marker. Um, this is the marker I was telling you about with PHLDA1. And trichoaps tend to be strongly uh, positive. Basals tend to be negative. However, I don't think this study uh, included cases of basal cell carcinoma with uh, follicular differentiation, which that's a problem. We also study uh, a different marker that is called protoplanin and try to separate these two neoplasms. As many of you know, this is a, uh, a vascular marker, uh, but it also stains uh, follicular epithelium. So, so that's why we used it. Um, as expected, most of trichoepitheliomas were positive for this marker. However, rare uh, basal cell carcinomas that have follicular differentiation were also uh, positive. So once again, this is not a magic bullet to try to separate these two neoplasms. Um, to conclude this topic, uh, in my opinion, immunohistochemistry it provides uh, only a limited support um, and diagnostic utility. I don't think it's very helpful, um, immunohistochemistry in this, in this setting. Um, if you want to use immunohistochemistry, my recommended panel would be to include CK20 and PHDLA1. That would be the, in my opinion, that's, those are the two best markers for this uh, distinction. Same story with uh, in trying to separate a morphine form uh, or infiltrated basal cell carcinoma versus a desmoplastic trichopithelioma. So here we have an example of an infiltrated basal cell carcinoma. If you have a biopsy like this, it's quite easy to make a diagnosis, right? Uh, here we have a high power of that. Tumor show these, uh, showing these infiltrated nests uh, with desmoplastic stroma with a DPI. This is actually very easy if you have a decent biopsy. The same here, this is an example of desmoplastic trichopithelioma. If you have a punch that shows the base of the tumor in the surface, um, it's a very easy diagnosis, right? However, not, all, not always you get biopsies like that. You get a surface, a small shape, so what do you do, right? It's very, very challenging. A same story uh, as before. Uh, in my opinion, CK20 is a fairly um, uh, useful marker for such a distinction. Uh, PHLDA1 is also useful in, in this context. Uh, here we have a couple of examples of that showing um, desmoplastic trichoaps being strongly positive for PHLDA1 and basals being negative. So, so if you see these, that might be helpful. Now changing topics. Um, this is also a very common problem that we encounter in dramatic pathology almost every day. So pagetoid Bowens or pagetoid squamous cell carcinoma versus extramammary pagetic disease. Both um, entities can show overlapping features and, and depending on the clinical setting or the context you're evaluating these, it can be quite challenging to make a diagnosis just on, on plain H&E. So this is very, very useful. Um, so as you know, extramammary pagets and, and pagetoid bowens or pagetoid squamous cell carcinoma in situ can have overlapping features. Um, sometimes it can be really difficult to distinguish the two entities and in my opinion, uh, IHC is quite useful to make uh, this differentiation. Here we have an example of pietoid squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Look at the full thickness of epidermis, and also you can see the single cells, right? If you see these in a sun exposed area, I don't think anybody's going to do uh, an immune histochemistry study. You just call it a squamous in situ to be done with it, right? Here we have an, an example, a higher power of these uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ showing the nice um, nest of uh, uh, atypical keratinocytes. 
sometimes useful features would be the presence of and the preservation of keratohyaline granules within the cells and also the presence of bridges between the cells. That by itself will, um, will help you in trying to make a clear cut diagnosis. Right? On the other hand, extreme memory patches disease I usually uh, represents uh, an insight to malignancy coming from the sweat dog, right? Uh, most likely to be apocrine on differentiation. However, some cases might represent uh, epidermotropic metastasis, as you as you may know. Here we have an example of that, uh, very similar to what we saw before. You have these full things in TPA, single cells. Uh, the cytoplasm can be can be quite ample. Sometimes you can even see mucin within the cytoplasm. Um, Look at the nest, also quite typical. In fact, this can look like melanoma many times, right? Sometimes you even need uh, IHC to separate this from melanoma. So uh, if you look at the literature, um, extra memory patches disease is usually uh, strongly positive for CAN 5.2, cytokeratin 7, CA, and ber 4 as opposed to a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, which most of the time is negative. However, I've, been, I've seen many cases, and if you read the literature too, you can encounter the many cases of squamous cell carcinoma in situ can be positive for these markers, right? So then if you have a, a patient, let's say, that is immunocompromised and present, presents with patches on genital areas, and you're not sure whether it's squamous in situ or pious disease, what do you do? In my opinion, P63 is quite useful. And we published this not too long ago with uh, one of my uh, residents we encountered that uh, all cases of uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ were positive for P63 as opposed to extra memory patches disease. And the reason is uh, because extra memory patches disease arises from the sweat dog, usually the apocrine, apocrine dogs, and P63 is usually not expressed. So here we have a case of extra memory patches disease, right, showing these pyotone cells, very typical ones. Um, look at the CAN 5.2 is strongly positive, CK7 is strongly positive, and look at this counter stain with P63 and H&E. If you see the background of normal keratinocytes, they're positive. However, the typical cells you can see in the arrow here, uh, they are negative for P63, and this is very useful. Um, this is very, very useful. Uh, P63 should be always positive if you have a case of Bowen's disease or squamous cell carcinoma in sight. Right here we have another example. Look at the normal keratinocyte being expressed uh, by P63. However, the nests of large cells are negative. So that's very useful. Here we have an example of pyotone squamous cell carcinoma in sight. Also look at, the, look at the full thickness, look at the single cells, right? As I said before, these, these neoplasms are usually negative for CK7, CAN 5.2, and very before. However, sometimes they can be strongly positive, right? So when you see that, what do you do? Again, P63 is highly helpful. In this case, P63 should be always be positive, not only in the background of keratinocytes, but in the neoplastic ones as well. So remember this, this marker in this uh, setting. Now uh, we're going to move on, and we're going to talk about CVHS carcinomas. Um, as you know, this is a rare tumor, uh, but can be quite challenging uh, to diagnose. We have two variants, the variant, the periocular variant, which is the most common variant and is very aggressive, uh, and you have the extraocular variant that is less common uh, and can be usually seen around the head and neck area. Um, both variants can be seen in the setting of Muir-Tourette syndrome. So, sebaceous carcinomas can be classified into, in two types. You have low-grade and high-grade sebaceous carcinoma, right? Low-grade sebaceous carcinoma can be easily identified because they tend to have increased amount of sebocytes, right? If you have a malignant tumor with increased amount of sebocytes, that will easily uh, help you to make a diagnosis. However, if you have a poorly differentiated sebaceous carcinoma with no sebocytes, that's a problem because these tumors, these poorly differentiated sebaceous carcinomas, can actually be confused with either basal cell carcinomas, sometimes with squamous cell carcinomas, sometimes with a metastasis too. Uh, there are certain features that you have to look for, it, especially around the head and neck, around the periocular area. If you have a tumor like this that is poorly differentiated, uh, this got some basal differentiations, but it doesn't have the palisading that you see in basals and you see committed necrosis, you should always be suspicious of sebaceous carcinoma. Here we have a higher uh, power of this neoplasm. Uh, and 
if you look carefully, you got you can see some civil size within the tumor as well, like in this example right here. Um, some other cases can be like this. You have this poorly differentiated tumor um, with these cells that are quite pleomorphic, many mitosis, clearly malignant, and you see these small little holes in these poorly differentiated cells. When you see a tumor like this, that is blue, basaloid, basophily, malignant, and it's got these little holes of, of white holes in the cytoplasm, you always have to think about sebaceous carcinoma. Here we have another example of the same tumor. Look at that. Look at the angulated nuclei. That would be a clue. Dr. Kasakov always, uh, he taught me that whenever you see a poorly differentiated tumor around the eye and you, you see this angulated nuclei, that should prompt you to think about always about sebaceous carcinoma. Uh, remember, sebaceous carcinoma can, can involve the overlying epithelium or epidermis. And sometimes if you have a shea biopsy, around the eye, sometimes uh, this can be easily confused for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Things to look for would be the presence of evacuated cytoplasm, uh, the lack of complete full thickness atypia. Um, those things should prompt you to think about sebaceous carcinoma. Look at this example, this large uh, cell with this uh, bodily evacuated cytoplasm. Those are things that you should, you should look always uh, around the eye um, to be suspicious of sebaceous carcinoma. If you look at the literature, uh, always uh, there have been many markers that have been used um, uh, to try to uh, separate sebaceous carcinoma from uh, it, their mimickers like basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. One of the most useful markers is EMA. However, EMA can be negative in a poorly differentiated sebaceous carcinoma. If you look, CK7 can also be helpful, however, CK7 is usually positive in basals, uh, and it's squames, while most of them are negative, rarely they can be positive. In my opinion, androgen receptor is not useful, not, not useful at all. I, I, I don't use never, I never use this marker to make um, this distinction. Um, the marker that is very helpful, and if you know how to interpret it well, it can be, it can be a lifesaver, is adipofilling. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about these. So recently, we, we just published this paper along with uh, uh, many colleagues of mine that are experts in this field, and, and we use we compare adipofilin with several markers, and we found that adipofilin was the most sensitive marker if you know how to use it correctly. So here we have an example of a poorly differentiated uh, sebaceous carcinoma. This example was strongly positive for EMA, was positive for CK7, and negative for BRF4, and this would be the classic immunoprofile of these tumors. However, um, we have found many cases of sebaceous carcinomas, especially those that are poorly differentiated, that are negative for EMA, they're negative for CK7, and they're positive for very before, and it can mimic by IHC alone, it can mimic, it can mimic a basal cell carcinoma. Now, this is the dipofilin, and remember, this is a marker that will highlight the lipids within the cytoplasm of, of these sebaceous carcinoma. So the, 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 the pattern that you want to see in these tumors is this. You want to see these little vacuoles, these little lipid vacuoles in the cytoplasm, and that should be interpreted as positive. Uh, let me show you this a case of mine that I had uh, not too long ago. Uh, this was an 80-year-old man that presented with this tumor around the eye. So you can clearly see uh, basaloid neoplasm, basophilic, with uh, quite prominent clear cell differentiation, right? So, so what is it? Is it a basal cell carcinoma with clear cells, or is it a uh, acevaceous carcinoma? And, and, and this is kind of quite difficult, actually. Just by looking at the histology, I would, I would favor basal, but let's see the IHC. So EMA was negative. That by itself will favor a basal. Remember, the poorly differentiated acevaceous carcinoma can be EMA, EMA negative, but most of them are positive. And this is a little feeling. So this is the pattern that you don't want to get confused with. This is a granular stain with adipofilin that is classically seen in basals and histocytic cells. It's not a lipid but color pattern that I showed you before. This is a granular pattern, and a granular pattern is interpreted as negative. So this actually is an, a really good example of basal cell carcinoma with clear cell features and not a sebaceous carcinoma. Now uh, let's change topics, and, and we're going to talk about another uh, uh, issue that comes uh, quite frequently in dramatic pathology, which is the distinction of poorly differentiated agnexal neoplasms versus metastatic carcinomas to the skin. 
uh, as you know, uh, many uh, neoplasm of the skin uh, or cutaneous neoplasms share histologic features with internal malignancies. And that is because many agnexal tumors have glandular differentiation. Therefore, if you have a poorly differentiated agnexal neoplasm, how do you distinguish it from, from, from a metastasis? It can, it, can be quite, it can be quite difficult. Remember also that most of these agnexal tumors um, uh, lack uh, epidermal connection. So, so that would be another thing to look for. Uh, and, and, and it can be it can be quite challenging. So as you know, um, metastases are are uh, uncommon. Um, they're very rare. Uh, they usually do not develop until until you have a wild metastatic disease. However, rarely they can represent the initial manifestation of an internal malignancy, um, and that would be a problem, right? If if you don't know that piece of information. Um, Mo the most common tumors that go through the skin are breast, lung, GI, ovary, and kidney tumors. Uh, in my opinion, uh, if you know how to use it well, immunohistochemistry plays a very important role in trying to separate these, these two uh, neoplasms. There have been many markers used uh, for this distinction, uh, including CK15, P63, D240, and cytokeratin 5-6. In my experience, uh, if you know how to use it well, P63 is the, is the most helpful marker for this uh, differentiation. So what is P63? P63 is normally expressed in epidermal and glandular basal cells and also in myopithelial cells. Remember, P63 is going to be positive in axon neoplasms, including acrine tumors. However, there is exception to the rule, right? There, there are two neoplasms that are classically a negative for this marker, and that is a primary cutaneous mus mus primary cutaneous mucinous neoplasms and apocrine tumors. Those two tumors are usually negative, and that would be the exception to the rule for P63. In my experience, P63 is positive in any other primary cutaneous neoplasm, including squames, basals, acrine carcinomas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but not on these two neoplasms. Uh, remember, P63 is not expressed in, um, in uh, most metastatic adenocarcinomas, including cases from the breast, lung, GI, or prostate. Uh, remember that P63 is going to be positive in all squamous cell carcinomas, regardless of the anatomic site, right? If you, so if you have a, let's say you have a lung cancer, the squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, the metastasis to the skin, P63 is not going to be helpful because we're talking about a squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma anywhere in the body is going to be positive for P63. This is very useful, again, as I said before, for glandular neoplasms. So this is a paper that we studied uh, not too long ago, and, and we compared P63 with other markers, and we confirmed that P63 is actually a very valuable marker for this distinction. So if you look at the literature and you compare the markers, you're going to find different results. As I said before, um, in my opinion, if you know how to use it well, P63 is a very useful marker. So here we have an example. This is an 82-year-old female uh, with a history of breast cancer that presented with this neoplasm on her arm. And the clinician uh, asked me, what is this? Is this a primary basal cell carcinoma or whatever on the skin, or is it a metastasis? Right? So we have here the histology. We have a tumor that is primarily primarily located in dermis without any clear-cut uh, connection to the epidermis. If you see it on high power, you're going to see this fully differentiated nest with some glandular differentiation, right? So it could be both. It could be either um, a primary fully differentiated acrine carcinoma or it could be a metastatic breast cancer, right? Uh, look at this glandular differentiation within this nest. Uh, and look at the P63. This is a strongly positive, right? So just by, by looking at these, you know that this is not a breast cancer. This is actually a primary um, a carcinoma uh, of the skin that is poorly differentiated, most likely of acrine origin. Here we have another example. This is a gentleman that presents with a nodule on his belly. Uh, we he have here a poorly differentiated neoplasm, clearly malignant epithelioid. Right? If you look closely, you see some glandular differentiation within this tumor. So what is this? Is it a primary carcinoma or is it a metastasis? Right? Look at the, look at the um, uh, immunoprofile. This tumor is clearly positive for cytokeratin, uh, negative for P63, uh, focally positive for 20, negative for 7. 
I called up the clinician and asked him where is the primary tumor, and he told me, oh, I forgot to tell you this patient has a history of prostate cancer. Here we go. P501S positive, so this was compatible with metastatic prostate adenocarcinoma. So if you know how to use it well, basically three is quite helpful. Um, remember, there's a exception to the rule when it comes down to basically three. If you have a primary operocan carcinoma that is poorly differentiated or even well differentiated, and you stand it for basically three, don't think it's a mat because apocrine carcinomas are usually negative, and the same with mucinous uh, carcinomas as well. And uh, we're going to talk about primary cutaneous mucinous carcinoma now, which is actually another neoplasm that can be quite difficult to, to, uh, to, to diagnose. So this is a rare neoplasm. Uh, the most common location for this neoplasm is around the head and neck, especially around the eyelids. That's where this tumor is most commonly seen. Uh, it's a slowly growing, flesh color, blue nodule. Uh, it's locally quite aggressive, however, usually done meta doesn't metastasize. Um, metastases are rare, uh, and they can go to uh, regional lymph nodes. Here we have an example of a mucinous carcinoma of the skin. Uh, the tumor is composed by this pulse of mucin, and with this pulse of mucin, you're going to have these cribriform uh, cells that have clear-cut ductal differentiation, as you can see here, right? So when you see something like this in the skin, your first reaction would be, is this a metastasis or a primary tumor, right? It can look like a metastasis, metastasis from the, lung, from, uh, from the GI tract, from the ovary can look at, or from the breast can look identical to this, right? Look at the high power. We have this uh, pulse of mucin. Look at these islands of cells with this creeform architecture. Um, so, so if you see something like this, uh, you always need to think about a metastasis. Remember, breast, GI, or ovary can look very similar. Uh, in most of the cases, clinical information would be very. Uh, very, uh, very helpful. Uh, if, you know, when, when patients have these tumors, um, they, they usually have metastasis all over the body. So that would be a very important piece of information you want to ask on your clinician. So, so if you see uh, this tumor around the eyelids, just based on the statistics alone, that most likely is going to be a primary mucinous carcinoma of the skin and not a metastasis. So uh, you can look at literature and, and see which tumors are positive for, for this neoplasm. Remember, as I said before, basically three is usually negative, and rarely can be positive, right? Uh, the same with the rectal markers. However, uh, in my opinion, what is very important here is, is to try to highlight the myopetilla layer on this nest. So if you have a tumor of the skin, right, and you see these atypical nests, and you have preservation of the myopetilla layer, you have a case that this is a primary tumor of the skin and not a metastasis. It's the same with breast cancer, right? If you see a uh, uh, breast you know, in situ that has preservation of the myopetilla layer that's in situ, not invasive, the same will apply here, right? So that's, that would be very useful if you see that, um, that myopetilla layer around these atypical nests. So here we have uh, an example of that. We have P63 that is clearly negative in the tumor. You have the nice internal control. The, the epidermis is positive. Here we have CK7 is strongly positive, right? This marker will not be helpful in trying to separate this tumor from a, a metastatic breast cancer. Both tumors can be positive, as you know. And here we have what I was telling you about before. If you see this nest, and you find myopetilla layer around this nest, that's very helpful and it's very key uh, piece of information that you want to know and try to separate these as being either a primary tumor or a metastasis. Look clearly here, we have a component marker and you have the myopetilla layer preserved around this atypical island of cells. So uh, these tumors can look like metastatic tumors by histology. Right, they are they're very similar, so you cannot make a distinction just by looking at histology. In my opinion, if you have a tumor uh, like this, call your clinician. You can save money on doing immunohistochemistry. Um, remember, CK7 is not going to be helpful. Both 
uh, primary tumors of the skin and breast cancer can be positive for CK7. The same will apply with estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors. These markers can be positive in both neoplasms, so it's not going to be helpful. And once again, what is helpful is if you have a preserved myopathy layer around the nests of atypical cells. Uh, you can use markers like p 3 troponin, or collagen-4, and this will be very helpful uh, to identify uh, the inside the component. I think that's, that's all I have. Uh, last of all, I don't know if you're there. Uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. If you have any questions, please, please let me know.